Topical corticosteroids are the mainstay of therapy. They will be for uh, uh, quite a bit longer. Uh, topical calcineurin inhibitors like um, tacrolimus and pimacrolimus, PDE inhibitors like crisabarol, crisabarol, antibiotics belong in only green if there's an active infection, if it's impetigenized. Antibiotics have no place in the treatment of atopic dermatitis routinely. The topical antimicrobials, bleach baths, sedating antihistamines like uh, diphenhydramine and hydroxazine are in yellow. There's no data to suggest they do anything. It doesn't mean they don't help you, right? Someone's really itchy, they can't sleep, you knock them out with some diphenhydramine or hydroxazine. Maybe they could wake up in the morning and feel a little more refreshed because they have an itch score of seven or eight out of 10. Phototherapy could be useful, it depends on where you practice. In the Northeast, there's a lot of phototherapy, right? We have active units. In the South, it tends to be less. Uh, if there's a lot of people from Texas, I'm not sure it's, it's readily available. In, in uh, Arizona, not so much, right? Yeah, and, and so the systemic therapies, I left off of this list were the cyclosporin, methotrexate, azathioprine, um, and mycophenolate, they were in the 2014 standard therapies, was the only thing we had. There were no FDA approved drugs. Now we have dupilumab, upatacitinib, abracitinib, tralokinumab. I expect before the end of the year we'll have extras. We have topical ruxolitinib, a JAK inhibitor that's really quite a pivotal additional therapy. So we're gonna unpack the use of these things throughout the day today. And what Joe said is critical. It's a small group, it's an intimate group. We're pretty easy going, even though I'm a very nervous person and I tend to worry about everything at work. Y you can ask me as many things as you want and there's no question that's, that's too silly. But I've been doing this 33 years and I worry all the time, right? And, and I think that worry keeps you sharp and keeps patients safe. I'm gonna go through top line results of the therapies, give you sort of the take home messages, right? And, and you take that and you, you find your own place for these things. There's no, there's, no play, there's, there's no universal number one therapy in psoriasis or in eczema. It's what you feel comfortable and it lets you to sleep at night and feel you give the best care. Dupilumab, the first breakthrough biologic drug for eczema, the first FDA approved eczema drug that's systemic, which is remarkable. It blocks the IL-4 alpha subunit receptor. So you got IL-4 and IL-13 circulating around in your blood. It docks on a cell that has an IL-4 and an IL-13 receptor dimerized like that. If you block four, you block the signal of floor four and you block the signal of 13. It's delivered subcutaneously. And in the initial trials, a lot of people forget this because this data goes back to about 2015 and 16. The original trials looked at every other week and weekly. And we don't use weekly a lot, but if you treat a lot of eczema patients, you do deploy it. The value of this is you'll see safety at 2x the dose you're normally using, and that's very valuable. So it's a loading dose of 600 in adults, right? So that's two syringes or two auto-injectors, one in each leg or one in each uh, flank to start, and then one every other week after that, or in this case, weekly. They were adults. They had a global assessment or three of four. We, we sort of tag eczema on a global assessment much like we do with psoriasis and other diseases. Zero is clear, like no disease. One is minimal, barely perceptible disease. Four is you're covered. Body surface areas of 30, 40, 50%, bad excoriations, lichenification. That's your easy score. Erythema, zero to four. Scale, crust, zero to four. Lichenification, zero to four. Body surface area. Um, so threes and fours are moderate to severe. Your one is mild, your two is moderate. So these were very active sick patients. And what we see, at week 16, um, a third of the patients who were threes and fours became zero or one. We had not seen anything like this other than four and five milligrams per kilo of cyclosporin could do something like that. Or of course, high dose prednisone for a long period of time. 
prednisone is specifically called out in guidelines as being inappropriate therapies for uh, treatment of atopic dermatitis. However, for intermittent emergency use, you know we all do it. It, it gets done routinely. It's just not for long-term therapy. So about more than a third of people got clear or almost clear, and half the people got a 75% reduction in the numerical scores for erythema, scale crust, light canification, and body surface area. You kind of know this data. It's been around. It's foundational. You know what your patients who go on dupilumab generally, how they're going to perform. A, a follow-on trial was something called solo continue. After about 16 weeks, if you hit a global assessment of zero or one, or you had an easy 75, what's called responders of your drug, you were able to enter into a trial that re-randomized your dosing. You either went from every other week to weekly to zero, no drug. You got dropped cold, your syringes had saline in them, or you stayed on your current dose, or you went to monthly and every other month. And this solo continue got a little air time and then it went silent. I think it's the most important data because how often do patients who are completely clear on a biologic drug say, hey, can I come off of this already? Like, I'm fine. Why do I need to keep taking this? And the answer traditionally is you gotta stay on the drug. But, but this challenges it a little bit. So what happens after you go from clear or almost clear to every other, uh, you stay on it every other week, you go to monthly, you go to every other month. Well, it turns out about three quarters of people who stay on the drug stay clear or almost clear. It doesn't, you, you'd think it'd be higher, but eczema is always doing this. Someone gets into a room with a bunch of cats right, or they stay at a great hotel like this and they overuse the scented moisturizer, which does smell very good, I gotta tell you. But it's gonna make an eczema patient flare, so you're pretty stable. But at one month, at every two months, more than half the patients are staying clear. It gives you a little room to play based on data that says, you know, you're clear. I wait to clear, not almost clear. I like clear, like they're doing great. And they're doing great for a long time, six months, a year. And then we can play with the dose a little bit. We can unpack that later. So I thought that was very interesting. And I have had to deploy it many times. So you've run into this perhaps when you have a patient on dupilumab. They're doing great, their body clears, they're a big mess, and all of a sudden they start getting this patchy eyelid and face dermatitis. Maybe they're getting conjunctivitis, which occurs 10 to 15% of the time, and I'm treating it with desonide and hydrocortisone, maybe a couple of days of triamcinolone, tacrolimus, you know, you're right in the pimacrolimus, you know, those burn, then you say, all right, we'll try some chrysoborol, that burns more, right? And you can't get it under control, and I don't have other drugs available at the time. So I know about Solo Continue. We downdose her, and I bring her down like a couple of days each. You gotta use the calendar. She, this is her on no topicals, on monthly dosing, and her body remains clear. So I don't have to jump off the drug. I could deploy the data that we have. Now remember, dupilumab is approved for six months of age and above, which is very reassuring for older patients who are scared to go on a biologic drug and go, dude, this is approved for like infants, six months old. So Trello um, fortunately has a dosing scheme exactly like dupilumab. You don't have to re or remember everything again. Um, and it's loaded the same way. The difference here is these come in 150 milligram syringes. So it's twice as many shots the flip side is the shots aren't as voluminous, right? 300 milligrams of drug is almost two cc's. It's like a small ping pong ball you're injecting in. So, you know, some people like it, some people don't like it. But you're, you're doing it the same way. Same endpoints, pretty similar entry criteria. When you've seen one of these AD studies, you've seen one of these AD studies because a lot of times the wash-ins are a little bit different. The analysis of the data is a little bit different. But when we look at global assessment of clear or almost clear, we don't see a third, we're seeing a fifth and a quarter, right? We're not seeing a 50% easy 75, we're seeing a quarter and a third. This drug does not look like it's performing as robustly at week 16 as dupilumab does. When you juice this study, 
by allowing patients to use ad lib topical steroids in mid potency, you can get it up to dupilumab. Now, when dupilumab juices its drug with topical steroids, it boosts its effectiveness too. So it always stays ahead. So it's it's perhaps not on its face as um, uh, effective, but you'll see some data later that says it probably catches up eight weeks later. It's probably a, a, a pretty good drug in that way. This uh, side effect profile, I just kept this for, for this one because it looks very similar to dupilumab. Very rare herpes simplex infections, very rare upper respiratory infections. You're not seeing the serious adverse events that keep us awake at night here, but conjunctivitis is probably the most common thing we have to deal with in the teens in dupilumab. Here, occasionally on one study, it's in, in, at 11%. There's some sense maybe we see less conjunctivitis and facial dermatitis with trilokinumab, which has been helpful for patients with recalcitrant face dermatitis on dupilumab. I have a place I can go after that, and, and uh, this has been pretty helpful. And the extra trial is like solo continue, but just different design. This is not at 16 weeks. This is not looking at responders. This is looking at anyone who's been in a trial before the open label extension. Of any sort, no matter how you're doing, you can enter it. However, there's a caveat here. You have to make it through 52 weeks of the other trial. How many people who are not doing well will stay in the trial for 52 weeks just to get into the open label extension? So while it's not technically a responder trial, it's probably an enriched population of people that says, I like this enough to stay in it a year and then go on the open label. If you're, if you're not doing that well, you're probably dropping out of some sort. So what do we learn from this one? If you look at 16 weeks, if you look at 16 weeks over here, you notice the, 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 the curve hasn't gotten asymptotic yet. It hasn't flattened. That probably happens at about week 24. So I, I, what I'm gonna tell you is a little more patience with this, you'll probably get to the same endpoint, and you get a good durable response. Now, the, on the face, whenever you see these analyses of drugs when they're all being compared to each other, you assume that the most effective one is gonna be the most effective for every patient, and it's not the case. It just doesn't work like that because we don't have that good a sense of how well the drugs attached to the pathophysiology of that patient. 